Our next speaker is Terry Nolan, Director of Nolan Meats, a family-owned integrated meat processing company situated in Gympie in southeast Queensland. Terry is an extremely active participant in groups representing the meat processing industry, particularly those that, are, that seek to advance the reputation of the industry and its products. Ensuring livestock are treated well from birth to slaughter is absolutely integral to the industry's reputation. And for many years now, Terry has supported the work of the Australian Meat Ind Industry Council's Animal Welfare Committee to deliver improvements from the point of slaughter right back up the supply chain. So I'd like you all to wish a warm welcome to Terry Nolan. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm quite a reluctant speaker here today, to be honest with you. Um, not that um, I'm not passionate about animal welfare, but um, I haven't been chair of the Australian Meat Industry since 2011, so I'm a past chair, if you like. But the, uh, what I am quite proud of is that we introduced our first industry standards during the time I was chair. Um, and I think that, was, that wasn't something that was driven by government, it was driven from within the industry. And, um, and, and there's a few people we should acknowledge uh, in that process. Um, Tom McGuire, who was a key driver, uh, Michelle Edge was a key driver, and um, numerous people. I see on Ben David sitting over there. We've had a few discussions in rooms about what should be in and what shouldn't be out. But I must say that we uh, we always found a, 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 a an even or equal footing. Um, the other thing that's become, or well, why I'm a reluctant speaker, I'm a bit in awe. Um, I'm in a room of um, academics, scientists, regulators, government officials. Um, people passionate, soul passionate about animal welfare. Um, and uh, I spent the first 22 years of my working life removing the hides from cattle to put table beef um, on the table in front of millions of Australians. Um, why does animal welfare matter to me? It's been my livelihood. Um, if I could just um, th draw some similarity to many of our previous speakers this morning, uh, I grew up with a dog, a couple of dogs actually, a couple of horses, you get attached to your animals. I appreciate that. I could never appreciate the suffering that animals um, would go through. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't grow an animal, you, you treat an animal with respect. We treat our animals with respect. We know that they will be processed into beef at some stage. It doesn't mean we can't process them respectfully. And so I think from that point of view, we're all on quite a equal footing uh, oh, I, no, I shouldn't assume that. Um, some people may not agree with processing animals, but there's a, a vast majority of the population that, that, that do consume red meat products. Um, I want to give you a bit of a look into our business, what we do. Sorry if it's a bit sort of self-centred. I want to touch a little bit on um, industry uh, process of developing and, um, and then just sort of put a few personal views forward on, on my views on animal welfare. Um, I'm, the other thing that's struck me today is that uh, I've just realised this morning I'm not as well prepared as uh, <laughs> many of the previous speakers having no notes and uh, just a few slides uh, uh, that I put together. I should say this, um, Christian Mulders from AMIC, um, when I was first asked to speak here, I said to Christian, I'm out of that league. Now I stood down in uh, December 2011, I said, you can go and speak to that. And Christian said, no, no, Terry, they want a, uh, a uh, industry player to speak at that. And uh, so Christian twist my, twisted my arm. I said, well, you do me up a few slides um, that, that I can speak to and I'll do the rest. And so with that, so I'm not, I'm not grateful for Christian for doing the slides for me, but I'm, um, I'm resentful that he didn't, <laughs> he, he, he didn't do this session for me. But thanks, Christian. Um, Nolan Meats, what do we do? Um, we're a 100% uh, Australian family-owned company. Um, it started by my uh, mother and father in uh, 1958, so we've been 58 years in business. I'm a second generation butcher, um, but we've gone from that one little butcher shop uh, employing two staff to the stage where we now employ about 420 staff. But importantly, we um, send a lot of uh, beef uh, around, around Australia, but also to the world. We export to the Americas, we export to Brunei, which I must hasten to say is a Muslim country that practices halal. Um, we export to Indonesia. We know the troubles we've had at Indonesia um, in recent years with live export. 
I'd, I like to see the cattle processed in Australia, there's no doubt about that. Um, I'm not a critic of the live export trade if it's done effectively. Um, I'm, a, I'm a critic of poor practice, ab absolutely. Um, we send products to Malaysia, another Muslim nation. I'd have to say that um, in the last oh, four months, I have an answered um, countless emails and letters from people who have been uh, into our business, targeted via social media, about halal and how cruel it is and uh, how it's funding terrorism. I've personally answered a lot of those emails myself. I have nothing to hide behind or stand behind and put my hand on my heart, knowing that I think we give the uh, most respectful and, and, and positive way we can process animals. And uh, I think that it really um, generates income for Australia. We're actually drawing money from animals that are processed in a tight, tightly controlled situation here in Australia, and it's bringing wealth to Australia, and it's far from funding terrorism. For all the people that wonder about certification, I know that's not the topic, but I want to touch on it. Um, we pay 60 cents a head for our certification for Hellel. Um, for, for that, we would recoup approximately $100 a head by selling into those markets, and things like lungs and spleens that Australians don't eat that we can sell to those markets overseas. So we're actually bringing money into Australia. So I'm, I'm quite um, proud to say that I'm a meat processor, I'm a second generation butcher. Um, we're vertically integrated. One of my passions have always, um, as I said, had a horse and a dog, and I, um, I only just heard it this morning, I was talking to Clive Richards on the outside, he said Mark Twain said that the, the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a man, and I think that's true. When you all get a bit frustrated and you want to go for a, a, a day off, or it is a day off, a bit of relaxation, go for a ride on the horse in the country. It's sort of, sort of that connection to the animal, um, and uh, my, uh, my daughter used to laugh at me, we'd drive out to the paddock and we sell graze cattle, and um, uh, so we move the paddocks every second day, and I just call the cattle, open the gate, that we don't... Um, muster them with a dog or a horse um, when we move paddocks, just call the cattle, they run, they go into a different paddock, into a fresh paddock and uh, she said, oh dad, you and your babies, because you do, you treat them like babies because you, ha you have this connection with livestock. So quite um, proud to say that we are a, a, a beef producer in a small way. Um, we are a feedlotter. Um, we do, uh, how would you say, uh, put cattle in small pens um, but with ample space we provide them good quality feed and water. We know the cattle do well. Just two weeks ago, I was um, went up to Julia Creek and um, uh, in some sort of quite droughted country, and you see cattle that are poor, um, some probably too poor to truck because of the effects of the horrendous drought that much of Australia's um, suffering at the moment. We bring those cattle into a, yes, it's a confined pen, it's 50 metres by, by 20 metres, um, but those cattle blossom and bloom and they're healthy and they're bright in their eye and they're clean in their coat. And um, I can't ima I know if I was an animal, I would rather that being fed um, twice a day in a feedlot, adequate water, growing, um, rather than wasted away by a water hole or a dried, dried up water hole in um, outback Queensland. So yes, we are a feedlotter. Um, we are a processor. Um, we do kill cattle. Um, we, um, it, it, I know all that talk about Indonesia. Just this week I have um, five Indonesian uh, students, uh, or we'll call them students, they're industry people from Indonesia. One's a vet and the other are uh, uh, abattoir operators. As part of our partnership with Indonesia, Australia Red Meat Partnership on Food Security, we're trying to lift the practices, try and, trying to improve what is happening over there. And we had this one Indonesian vet and she's doing a monitoring on our knocking and um, we, we monitor every day um, 100 animals out of the 500 we kill. We do a, an audit, if you like, a verification, to make sure there's no vocalisation uh, or no vocalisation beyond limits, um, no down on stock and things like that. And this, uh, the first day, this um, Indonesian vet, she came back in and didn't have, spoke through an interpreter. She said, this is just amazing. We have nothing like this in Indonesia. And she, she was quite impressed. So we can... The interesting thing about that... Um, they went round to every abattoir in Australia and no one wanted to take them. no one wanted to assist them because they might become a competitor to Australia. You can yes, ban it, stop it, do whatever, but you can also lift the standards and I think there should be some credit for people for lifting standards. Um, and I agree with the comment of John. It's it, it, it's a journey, it's not a destination. I can see what's happened to animal welfare and the, the difference across society um, in my lifetime. And um, and I I could as a a kid going to school, we would go out to the um, slaughter yard, small slaughter yard back in those days doing 
probably 10 cattle and five pigs a week. We'd have an iron bar, we'd hit the pigs across the head to stun them, and then we'd bleed them. That's what happened in the mid-70s in, in some things. I just find that horrendous now. I, I find it, you know, quite abhorrent. Um, and I, I'll throw this in because my wife and I agree on lots of things. We have one fundamental thing we just cannot agree on. She likes to go fishing. Um, I just hate fishing. I think what we do with our livestock, the way we low stress handle them, the way we walk them into a into a, uh, a temple ground and design crush, we stun them, we, we restrain them, we stun them, we we um, we do a halal cut. It's done with, uh, within 30 seconds of stunning. The animals are you know dead. There's no pain. Um, it, it, it's qu quite good. I almost get sick seeing people go deep sea fishing, catching a fish, winding it up, the eyes pop out. Um, they take the hook out of the mouth and then say, oh, it's too small, and they throw it back. Or they put it on the floor, or conversely, put it on the floor of the boat and it flip-flops there until it suffocates. You might think that's really strange. <laughs> My wife grew up in a family that liked, liked fishing. I grew up in a family that didn't like fishing. I can't understand why people have recreational fishing is OK, but meat processing is not. It, it really um, confounds my... Um, my belief systems, and I, I don't know if anyone's thought about that, but I think that, um, yes, that's one of the big issues that I just can't come to terms with. Um, yeah, we process about 2,800 cattle a week. Um, we have a massive feedlot turnoff, about 124,000 cattle a year, so we're virtually self-sufficient in cattle. Um, we only buy in a, a couple of hundred a week um, from outside producers. Because we didn't like what was happening in some areas, we wanted to improve the standards, and we thought, having greater control of the whole supply chain gave us better outcomes in a number of areas. Um, when you have a business, you don't really know how you align thinking, and it's about aligning thinking. And um, we've put a lot of work into our small company into documentation. Um, we coined a, uh, a vision statement, which is quite aspirational, and a lot of people laughed at it. Um, our vision statement, delivering pleasurable meat moments every time, People thought it was a bit warped. Um, <laughs> and we had trouble getting people to accept it. But what's a pleasurable meat moment? Just the other day, um, Tuesday, a guy in our boning room saw in vertebrae, put the bandsaw through the edge of his thumb. Not very pleasurable. Not for him, not for me, not for the doctors, not for the um, anyone who has to strap him. It's just not pleasurable. Um, I had a, uh, my office, um, sits just beside where the trucks come to the loading ramp. Um, a truck came in the other day, came in way too fast. We have 20 kilometre limits on our property. He was exceeding that. He pulls up outside the door, puts the brakes on, and I heard the cattle in the back of the tra truck rattling forward like dominoes um, in a crate. I stopped what I was doing, walked outside. He's backed onto the ramp by that stage because then he reverses back at a rate of knots. And I said, mate, I don't know what you think you're doing. That's the worst driving I've ever seen on this property. And uh, he said, I don't know who you think you are. You can get stuffed, mate. <laughs> and I said, well, I've got your number. I don't want your name. I'm ringing the trucking company now, and you are banned from our property for life. Never want you back here again. End, end of the story. So we do take a passion. I get quite um, upset. It takes us, or takes producers 15 months or depends on the age of the cattle, 12 to 15 months, to get an animal up to suitable weights for us. We then put them in the feedlot for about 70 days, about two and a half months. So we say they get the best of both worlds, free grazing as well as um, uh, grain finishing. Um, so between the producer putting the bull to the cow, the calf being born, growing and getting to us, it takes about three years to get that animal to a, a processing stage. It takes them three minutes, and I won't say the word I said, but it started with F. It start, takes them about three, less than three minutes, probably three seconds to bugger it, stuff it. Um, and it just annoys me immensely. So that wasn't a pleasurable meat moment for me. It wasn't a pleasurable meat moment for the livestock on the truck. It wasn't a pleasurable meat moment for the driver. It wasn't a pleasurable meat moment for the um, owner of the business when I rang him to, to ban his driver. So, I mean, you can. it, it may be laughable, it may be funny, but delivering pleasurable meat moments is what we're about, and that's what we try to ingrain in our people. Um, beneath that, we have a mission statement that we, we do, and it's more about guidelines. We have five key um, areas that we address not, uh, that we address through our mission statement. Then we get to the, the, the prickly area of policy. 
coming down from the top is all the things that we like to do. Then you have government regulators, legislation and um, regulation come in from the side. That's the pointy end, where we, what, what we want to do and what is uh, permissible by law, um, what is expected of the community. So we try to write policies. If I stood here today with all the legislation, the regulation that we have to comply to, whether it be workplace health and safety, whether it be, I mean, I'm trying to take a whole of business view to this discussion. I know that some people in the room are purely focused on animal welfare and I appreciate that view. I do have a bit of a different view because we have to run a commercial business and so we have to comply with all sorts of, you know, loading limits on trucks, driver times, workplace health and safety, um, you know, rehabilitation, um, uh, food safety, labelling, international labelling, dual labelling, uh, it just goes on and on. If I stack the legislation that we comply with, piled on each other, there would be a pile here taller than me. Uh, literally, that's not exaggeration. So there is a lot of control and a lot of regulation out there. We try to distill that down so we can communicate to a workforce that is semi-literate. As I said, I'm talking to scientists, vets, academics. I didn't go to tertiary education. I finished year 12 and went straight out to be a slaughterman. We have people working for us that were kicked out of the schooling system in year 10 um, that are illiterate. We've got to make them comply with that legislation and what we want to do over here into one small document they can read and can, can take an interest. So we have a number of policies across our business which are, are quite critical to how we operate. And um, none of those policies are long with a one page because, of course, because if they are long with a one page, no one will read it and it won't matter. So you know, they talk about the QA manual on the um, collecting dust on the, on the shelf. It, it is so true. You've got to keep things very um, simple. A fellow told me years ago, uh, if you want to write a letter, restrict it to 267 words because people won't read more than that. It's probably true. I mean, I often run over that. <laughs> the intro in there is 500 words, I think. But, the, uh, but it's probably true. If you want to get quick uptake from people, and especially from a semi-literate community, keep, the, keep it punchy and hard-hitting. Um, so policies are important. Then we get down to what we call custom procedures. Someone, I think it was Jan, said about standard operating procedures, or SOPs, they're quite commonly referred to. We say, no, we don't have any SOPs in our business. We have customer procedures because everybody in the chain has a customer. And um, so whether I'm skinning this leg on this animal, which I did for many years, and I send it down to him and it's not quite presented right, I'm, um, he's my customer. I can't send him faulty goods. So that's important to us. And then, of course, we have forms for verification. So I, I, I spent a bit of time on that because it's an important starting point for any business to have the documentation, doc, documentation compiled, accurate, concise, and, and um, easily communicable. Um, yeah, that's the one that a lot of new people laugh at when they see it, but it means a lot to us. It's about the good meat on the plate. It's about the well-treated animal. It's about the safe workplace. It's about all those sorts of things. Um, we talk about ethics. We have a clear section demoted, uh, devoted to um, ethical standards. Five dot points is, is a key pillar of our mission. Um, we talk about quality outcomes via systems. So, we, yeah, we have quality systems. you also got to look at the culture of the people. Um, uh, so we talk about delivering value because we don't deliver value, we can't improve the world. It's all right to... You know, people have this thing about zero tolerance. There's not a person in the room that hasn't done something wrong that they can't go back and review it and do it better next time. You can't go straight from abhorrent animal welfare procedures to the perfect model over here without some journey along the way and some learning. Um, there needs to be enjoyment for everybody, otherwise people don't, um, don't pick up and learn. Um, and you need to keep bringing innovation. It is, bit, it is about learning. There's things that we've got now that make transport so much easier. In about 1991, we trialled the first um, B-double truck with um, airbag suspension. Doesn't sound like a big deal to people sitting in the room. Massive deal to us. Um, we loaded cattle at Richmond in North Queensland to travel down to our feedlot at Cinnabar. We put some cattle on the rail. We put some cattle on conventionally sprung trucks. We put some cattle on airbag suspension trucks. The, the uh, two trucks arrived at the same time. The conventional sprung truck, the cattle were sore-footed and, and they were... Um, from, from, jar, from the jarring on the springs. Um, the airbag cattle, we know they went on to feed um, almost 36 hours earlier onto full feed ration than the cattle that were jarred up in the truck. The cattle that came down on the train two days later, we never railed again after that and haven't railed to this date. It was, a, it was ridiculous um, f from that point of view. So all those sorts of things, um, 
it's about bringing innovation. Airbag suspension on trucks is a great thing. Um, thankfully, modern rail carriages um, have been upgraded from those old wooden clackety clack things, and, and they're, they're so much better. Um, so we need to think about what we can do a bit innovative, and we need to work together with people with different views to try and engage a bit of discussion and improve the situation. Um, everyone's got to have a photo. That's just some blonde Aquitaine cross cows and calves that we breed. Run about um, 400 cows on about 4,000 acres west of Gympie. Um, that's a picture of our feedlot. Um, we like to um, uh, have cattle that are um, in about that 200, 280 kilos dressed weight, we talk, um, because that's what we think of them as. Um, but you can't get them prime unless you treat them well. And we have you know, good animal welfare standards throughout the feedlot. Um, there's our abattoir, and if you look um, just, oh, point it, this down here, this is holding yards below the abattoir. Each holding yard has a grain bin in it, so the cattle are fed the full ration they were fed at the feedlot, so there's no deprivation of feed. Um, even the wagon wheel design, we used to have pens that were sort of long and narrow, and the cattle didn't like go, go oh, hold on me, I better hurry about that. I've got a half hour talk here. Um, <laughs> Right, uh, that's just cattle in pens. Um, slaughter for you don't want to see. That's what we do. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't prepare this just as well. Um, uh, good animal welfare practices, from an industry standpoint, is not negotiable. It's a requirement of our customers. It's a requirement of the community. Um, and as a business and as an industry, we're all committed to the highest level of uh, animal welfare treatment. And you know, the 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 mission of the um, the Australian Meat Industry Council and the Australian Processor Corporation is to uh, ensure that acceptable animal welfare standards are implemented uh, and verified right across the industry. Um, the, uh, we have a, a, a comprehensive um, systems approach to animal welfare, and as I say, we, this is not government underpinned, it's not government driven, it was industry initiative and it's out there and it's working and there's about 70% 70 70 compliance across there. Um, it, it's um, independently ordered by uh, Ausmeat um, or Ausqual, you can use either. Um, and it's, and it's driving a positive animal welfare culture through the plant. Uh, it was first developed in 2005, I think it might have been about 2003, Ben, we sat around the room and we had some differences of opinion and we got to a, a, a standard where Hugh launched that standard at our um, industry conference in 2005 at the Australian Meat Industry Council conference. Um, it's been reviewed since um, in 2009 and we have Dr Alicia Hewitt doing a, a, a review at the current time. Um, the... Uh, as I said, it's independently audited and uh, we're finding high compliance rate within Australia. There's talk about Australia doesn't lead the world in animal welfare. I don't have any to support this, but we have lots of overseas reviewers from Europe and from um, the USA and from Malaysia and, uh, and people are amazed at the animal welfare standards in Australia. I'd like to know how the Australian, industry, the Australian meat processing industry sits. I think we may be a world leader. I, I can't claim that, I don't know, but I'd be very surprised if we're not. Um, it's in 60, 60 establishments uh, across Australia, which represents about 70 to 80% of all cattle, uh, of all uh, red meat processed in Australia, and it is growing. Um, Mintrack, our meat industry training group, um, they deliver animal welfare training and, and underpin the standard. Um, there's about 2,300 employees that have been trained um, through the animal welfare process. Um, back to Nolan Meats, why is it important to us? It just makes good sense. I, I'm a bit like Jan. I don't know how to stand here and just talk about. It just does. It makes sense. Um, I, I could talk 30 minutes wide and all, everything we do it, but to just answer that question, it's hard to do. Um, our customers expect it. I've got McDonald's up there. They're, they're the biggest user of red meat in the world. McDonald's drove this um, in the early 2000s. Um, our brands depend on it. We have private selection out there. We say it's the best meat you can buy and all the rest of it. Um, but we need to be transparent so that people can see what we're doing. Um, and it only performs when we're performing. The brands only perform when the system performs um, and the business becomes successful because of that. You don't put your logo all over your boxes and send them all around the world if you're not proud of what you do. Um, the, uh, we were also um, involved in the initial MSA, Meat Standards Australia Steering Committee. You say, what's that got to do with animal welfare? Part of the outcome of um, MSA is, was a tenderness guarantee for beef. But we knew that we could only get tender beef if we had good on-farm management practices, good transport practices, good processing practices, good chilling practices, and use the right cut for the right purpose. So um, we've then linked all our producer premiums back to 
their compliance to MSA. And uh, if everything's not done in the chain, there's no premiums for it. So people sort of, they might sell to another plant that's not, not as strict, but there's nothing wrong with someone leading the charge and saying, no, this is how we want it. Um, there's what we call um, a, a glycogen depletion. If you, uh, you, I, in one of those slides I showed you about grain bins in the, in the pens, if the animals are deprived of feed or water, the glycogen levels drop. When you process that animal, um, that glycogen converts to lactic acid through the normal rigor mortis process. You need to have a pH of about 5.3 to 5.7 to hit the window of ideal meat quality. If you don't hit that, um, you, you, you've, got, you've got holes in the bucket for the glycogen bucket, we call it, if there's poor handling, poor transport, poor whatever. Um, so it just makes sense. Poor livestock handling equals poor meat quality, equals dark cutting meat, equals unsaleable meat, equals lost income, equals destroyed brand, which then you've got a failed business. Um, yeah, transport, all transport is accredited to truck safe, and even if they've got an accreditation, you've still got to go and do your own monitoring to make sure they're delivering what you want. Time. Gone. Um, the, uh, perhaps if I speak for another minute, I won't get any questions then. <laughs> the, yeah, so, um, and in the feedlot, there's a national feedlot accreditation system which, which um, strictly um, uh, includes model code of welfare practices for animals, um, and it, it, it's very much linked into what we do. That's another shot of cattle in the holding yards. We actually put shaving down every three weeks just to let cattle rest and spell. Those cattle, to me, don't look too disturbed or upset. Um, the, um, we have our animal welfare standards and our, and our um, ordering process, but we also employ low-stress stock handling. Um, it's implied through the system, but we also have external people doing low-stress stock handling. We can tell cattle that come from a, a low-stress herd as cattle that come from a, a, a conventional, if I hate to say that word. Um, so it's an extra. Um, it's about the culture. Um, it makes economic sense. Our business depends on it. Temple Grandin noticed a behavioural scientist. She said, you've got to understand Basque. F for ba a lot of people, the, the word Basque might mean comfortably lying out in the sun. But for us, it equals behaviour, attitude, skills and knowledge. If the behaviours are poor, little else matters. You can have the best designed system. You've got bad culture, bad behaviours in the best system. You'll get a worse result than someone out in the paddock. I, I, I saw a fellow, Jim Lindsay, years ago, loading wieners in a paddock walking up a ramp onto a truck with just three people pushing around. They understood low stress stock handling, understood pressure release. They had no facilities. So you, you've got to combine the two. So behaviours of your people are important, which means training is important. Um, and just to finish, the Coomber effect, uh, effect of a system-based approach, uh, Van Gogh said, great system, or great things are done by a series of small things brought together, and that's what we like to think we do. So uh, thank you very much. Gone. No, 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 you don't get to go yet. Uh, look, Terry, thank you so much. I think you've really put into words or, or shown through um, the work that you do that difference between just caring about animals but actually caring for animals. So, And I know it's a big thing um, with this audience to, to come and talk about meat processing, but you did a fantastic job. Thank you. We do have time for a couple of questions. Thanks, Terry. Um, looks like you're doing some great things in Australia with Nolan. Um, uh, it's Cathy Beersrow from Pets for Life. And when the 7.30 report a few years ago came out with what happened in Indonesia, I was so traumatised I stopped eating red meat. And I vowed I wouldn't start eating red meat again until live exports banned. And I'm just wondering how long I have to wait. You know, I'm pretty hungry right now, actually. Oh. But um, so I just, um, I just want to know what your position is and what can, what can we do to kind of move things forward a little bit faster? Um, I don't have a position on live export. Obviously, I have a commercial position uh, that I'd rather all cattle processed in Australia. That's my commercial position. From an ethical standpoint, if um, they're going to ban live exports, should we ban cruise ships for people? I don't know. Is there a way that livestock can travel fairly, um, arrive in good condition? I don't understand it. I'm not qualified to answer that. Um, I think it's a simplistic view to say ban everything that the world doesn't agree with. Uh, I think we have to acknowledge where we are, go on that journey, how do we improve it? If we've trialled 
all the um, processes and we have to ban something, yes, we ban it. Uh, but if people are making genuine efforts to improve, I don't know that we should criticise them. Um, the, if, if the public um, pendulum swings that way, so be it. But I'm not a live exporter. Um, it's still happening. I thought the very least I could do was put our company out on a limb and help the people in Indonesia, once it gets there, to understand what's happening, how do we improve. I mean, the SCAS system that, that live cattle go to Indonesia on, it's way better. It's vastly better than what was happening beforehand. So there's improvements being made, but I'd rather not get into the live export debate. Economically, I'm against it. Ethically, um, you've got to say, can we do this a different way? I'm just going to take the... The, um, no, no, stay there. I'm just going to take the chair's prerogative and actually ask you a different question. Mm. Um, what could um, the Australian government do to help expand the meat processing export industry? <laughs> There's a hundred things. <laughs> a thousand. Um, somehow or other, they need to reward the good performers and have less legislation, regulation and compliance um, cost um, applied to the good performers. Um, so there's almost, we need this base level and we have a whole huge compliance cost. If we got rid of some of our cost of compliance, and I'm not saying do the wrong thing, but have self-compliance and, yeah, undergo audit, a lot of people wouldn't realise... Um, we get ordered enormously in our industry. We did a trial into the US. This is a bit off track, but it'll give you some idea. Um, we did a trial into the US in 2006 to 2008. We became the first company on the globe to put company-based inspected meat into the US system. Pre prior to that, every all meat was inspected by um, federal government meat inspectors. That came at a huge cost, um, and industrial-wise, it wasn't good. To get to that process in 2007, we had 287 audit days on our site and we only worked 250. So, you know, how much more audit, how much more scrutiny do you need to be under? You don't have an audit without some cost. We had a, a, a five-day audit, uh, which we tried, tried to combine our Woolworths, our Coles, McDonald's, cost us $35,000 just for, to pay the auditor. And then we have nine staff there hosting them around the plant. So it's a huge cost. The cost of compliance in Australia is killing the Australian industry and if we could reward the good performers and penalise the bad performers, we would have a bigger industry.